Um, can I just confirm with everyone? Um, can you see the slides? Yes, okay. Um, worry, you can actually use the chat, um, the chat button. Hi, Guna, how are you? I'm doing great. <laughs> Okay, so that's um, past two minutes already. Sorry about that. Okay, can we just start? Um, there's not going to be any moderator for the session today. I'll just start on my own. All right, good morning, everyone. Thank you for being here. I really appreciate you spending the time. And um, today, to be honest, I am going to, um, I'm going to share with you um, a little bit on what I have been doing um, research, the research that I've been doing, and my focus is on um, the students, Malaysian students in the UK and Malaysia. So um, this is, uh, right, I hope you can see this. Can you see? Yeah, I think you can see, right? All right. Um, <clears throat> Okay, so basically, this is the title of my sharing session today, and um, let's not waste any more time. Oh, no. Okay. All right, there you go. So basically, in Malaysia, we have three main um, documents that we focus on, and these documents are the documents that we refer to when we have questions about our system. For example, we have the National Education Philosophy, which I'm pretty sure everybody knows. And the next one is the Malaysian Education Blueprint, <clears throat> which also is, uh, I think we're very familiar with. And the last one is the curriculum itself. So when I look at these three um, documents, our education documents, they all focus on the students being competent, the students being knowledgeable, the students being having competence, um, language proficiency, good ones. They are competent in using the language. They are good in communicating. So all these three documents, the ones that we've been referring to, these are their focus. Okay. Uh, I mean, obviously, they also focus on other things, but um, for the sake of today's um, sharing, um, this is what we're going to do. Focus on. So, all right. Mm. Oh, sorry. Ah. Okay. However, a lot of studies have been done on looking at how the Malaysian students communicate in classrooms. And most of this research found that they don't speak as much as we want them to speak. And in fact, um, a lot of um, employers mentioned that our graduates, they lack of communication skills, which focus and, and they focus, they, they emphasize on the language proficiency. So, uh, however, I also found in a, a research, um, a, quite recent, to, in 2012, who we, um, Hamidah looks at um, Malaysian children in UK primary schools. And one of the children, the six children, was interpreted as being attentive. And this is because, you know, um, she interpreted it from his behavior when he uses English with his parents at home and his school friends. And, but at the same time, English is not his first language. So my focus today is particularly on um, students' um, identity. So when students come into our class, they bring their identity. They bring a lot of things that they focus on. Uh, they bring themselves, you know. And when, when we say they bring themselves, we say that they bring the habitus. So if you talk about habitus, obviously you have to talk about Bordeaux. Bordeaux mentions that, you know, um, if I were to give a, if I were to give um, an analogy, uh, habitus can be considered as a train. 
So, you know, when you, you have a, a, a new train and as the train moves along the, the, the rail, um, more people coming in and more people go out, right? So this is the student's identity, the student's life, the student's habitus. You know, they, they bring in their own habitus, the train, and then they go off, um, uh, they move forward, they move to another stage of their life, and um, they meet more people, they leave more people, you know, from this, they bring, they bring their, their, themselves, they bring their language, they bring their sense of belonging, their culture, their beliefs, all of these are considered as students' identity. And today, in particular, I'm going to focus on their identity. identity. Okay, so what is identity? So what is agency? You know, let's let's talk about terms here. What is agency? Agency basically is the control that we have as agents, you know, as human beings on the decision that we want to make. You know, for example, we want to, uh, the decision that we make, um, we want to, um, I don't know, to, to, to buy a new car, right? And it's our agency. We are being attentive. Do we want to buy a, a more expensive car or do we want to buy a cheaper car? So it's up to us. We decide. So we take control of our life experience. So that is basically what attentive is, taking control. And when we take control, we also affect other people and we also affect us. Okay? So being attentive, <clears throat> excuse me, being attentive is basically um, taking role. So when, when we say we are attentive, that means we take role, we take the position, we take, um, we take the decision to make based on our own perceptions, based on our, um, our, our experience. So we decide, okay? And student agency particularly, um, allowing uh, or the, the fact that they have the ability to to, to, to take control, to decide on things, to decide on how they want their learning experience to be, you know, and um, they, for example, they are being attentive when they choose which topic they want to focus on in classrooms or, you know, the kind of contributions they want to make in their classrooms. So they make the decision, they take control, they make the decision, and that is what we consider as attentive. And some students, they also um, they are also being attentive when they consider, okay, I don't want to contribute, you know, so that's, and, and um, they, they don't say that just because um, they don't want to contribute, there are reasons why they want to contribute, and they know these reasons, they understand why they make this kind of decision, okay, and um, attentive also allows them to, like I said earlier, to to, to choose the kind of educational experience that they want, you know, whether they want to be um, passive, they want to be active, they want what the kind of culture, what do they want to bring into the classroom, they decide that, okay? So, um, next I'm gonna briefly, I'm not gonna bore you on how I collected my data, but I'm gonna briefly share with you um, how I, I, I did um, get this um, data from. So I did three ways. One is the first, the first one is classroom observation. I went to classroom, classrooms. I went to, um, to look at uh, how they interact in class and I took field notes and everything. And I also did interviews and focus group discussions. And all of this data that I got, I got a massive like ugh, um, data. Um, I used thematic analysis by Braun and Clark, and also I used identity interaction framework by Bukholz and Hall. So these are the two frameworks or the two data analysis procedures that I used. And in this context, when I talk about seminars, I don't talk, you know, in Malaysia, we know seminars are somewhat like a conference, but in the UK context, we use seminars as tutorials that uh, we know it as tutorials in Malaysia. So um, I'm gonna change, I'm gonna use these two terms interchangeably, okay? So let's move on to um, my data. So with my data, as you can see, I have the UK data and I have the Malaysian data. And this data um, uh, in this particular one is the seating arrangements or the seating maps or the seating plans, you wanna call it of um, the students in Malaysia. As you can see on the right hand, sorry, on the left hand side is from the UK. And this is the one that I, uh, this, excuse me, 
for this particular um, seminar, I took the one where Semek, a Malaysian student, a pseudonym obviously, mm, uh, moved forward to the whiteboard to um, share her, her her answers, which I will um, explain further later. And but if, if you can see the arrangement, right? <clears throat> Both Malaysian students, Samet and Ain, they sit next to each other, which is typical of international students from what I've observed. And they don't mix around with the rest, you know. And from my observation, even though Ain is sitting next to another student, a non-Malaysian student, they did not interact, but they only interacted between the two of them. Okay, and the one in Malaysia, uh, if you can see, um, what I've done is um, F is a female, uh, male is a male, M, Malay, C, Chinese, and I, Indian. Okay, and I and T is international. If you can see from here, right, F, C, they stay together. You know, M, C, uh, F, M, they stay together. They sit together. F, I, they sit together. And this class is full. Okay, so it's interesting to see um, that, that, um, Malaysian student in Malaysia, in, in the Malaysian context, we, pre we, we prefer, well, not to say we, but yeah, we prefer to sit among ourselves, you know, among our own eth um, ethnicity. You know, I don't know why I did not ask. Okay, so moving on to the main thing that I wanted to share with you. So why are Malaysians considered, uh, why are Malaysian students considered or why are they interpreted as identity? So the first student that I'm I'm sharing with you today is Enot. She's um, a Malaysian um, student in the UK. So Enot is an interesting um, is an interesting participant. Okay, what she did was um, in the in the beginning of the term, the academic term, she verbally contributed quite a lot. You know, she talked to the tutor, she talked to other friends, and she talked to obviously the Malaysian students. Okay, but as the term progressed, she she um, stopped. She, she did. She did not verbally contribute anymore. But she non-verbally contribute. She raised her hands when when tutors asked questions. She um, nodded. She took notes. You know, and as the term almost ended, she became very. Um, uh, she, she did not contribute at all. She got lost. Uh, you know, if I if I were to use the term lost, okay, and. She was always on her mobile. Um, it's interesting to see, I think, because um, she's and she's aware that she's on her mobile because during of my interview sessions with her, she mentioned to me that you know um, uh, at the end of the term she said you know she she I, uh, the lessons were dull, she just got bored and she turned to her mobile. Okay, how uh, and and. Um, when I'm saying that she's not engaging, okay, when she's not um, uh, verbally contributing, it does not mean that she's not um, she's not focusing, okay, and she's passive. It doesn't mean that she's passive. It just means that you know, okay, this is how it is. I just can't focus anymore on the class, on the seminar, okay. However, what's interesting is that and not in particular is the go-to person. What I mean by go-to person is that she's the person that um, her friends go to when they have problems with the content, okay? And she actually graduated with a first class, okay? So my point is, even though she's not verbally contributing, even though um, she decides to be a little bit distant from the content during seminars, it doesn't mean that she's a bad student. It doesn't mean that she's not a smart student, no. But it means that she knows how she needs to study. She doesn't. She probably thinks that she doesn't need to be in class most of the time because she can do the exercises at um, uh, outside of the classroom. And interestingly, when I talk to her, my interactions with her after the outside of the the, the seminars, she mentioned that uh, I saw. Her, okay, I, I saw her. She she's always um uh, with her notes. She's always doing exercises. So do you see what I mean? It's her, her behavior in the class, in the seminar, is very different from, from her outside. You know, she's a studious person, she's a studious student outside. Okay. So that is why she um uh from my interpretation, she can be considered as being attentive. You know, she knows how she studies and she decides, she takes the role to decide um to not contribute during the seminar. Okay, and despite all that. There you go. She's a smart student. She 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 excels academically. 
All right, so she can be considered or she can be um, interpreted as being attentive. The next student that I'm sharing with you is Samak. So Samak is also um, a Malaysian student in the UK. So Samak is also interesting. Throughout the semester, she's always um, verbally and non-verbally contributing. You know, she raises her hands, she um, shares answers, like I told you earlier, and she's always like taking notes. And according to her, when I interviewed her, she said that, you know, it's important to take notes because, I mean, obviously, you know, you can refer back to it later. What's interesting about Samak, the reason I'm, I'm, I'm considering, I'm interpreting her as being attentive is because she... She shared um, with me uh, and, the, uh, and her friends during uh, interview and also focus group that she was being marginalized. She was being marginalized during um, small group discussions. So what, uh, what her, she told me was that, you know, she shared her, she shared her idea. She uh, gave her point. She explained her answers to the small group, but it was ignored. So she feels that she's marginalized. And despite this, despite being marginalized, and she knows she was being marginalized, she said, you know what, um, if I want people to know my points, you know, then let, be, let it be. You know, I, I, I don't need to, to, to make a point. I don't need to prove to anyone that I'm good because I know that I'm good. You know, I don't need to share, um, to share opinions. I don't need to share answers. But what's interesting is that she did share her answers, you know. So depending on the context of the seminar on that day, I think, you know, um, she decides on how she wants to, 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 to experience her learning. So again, this is why one of the reasons that, you know, Samet can be considered as being, uh, as being attentive. So the next student is Ming. She's, uh, he's also a um, Malaysian student in the UK. Um, and with Ming, he did not verbally contribute at all, you know, during whole, whole, whole group discussion, during, uh, but she, he did a little bit during um, small group discussions. And she, he non-verbally contributed. Yes, many times he took notes, you know, and he nodded, he, 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 he was engaged with the content. But um, during my discussion, or during my interview with her, what, she men what he mentioned was, he said, my learning style is different. You know, he said, um, even um, even if, let's say, I do have a question, even if, let's say, I, I don't understand something, I don't ask during seminars, I don't ask during the class. And he said that, you know, he would go home, he would Google, he would um, go to his books, and if he really, 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 really needs to, um, uh, to ask someone, then only he ask, but he will not ask during the seminar. That's what he said. So, so and and um, from the uh, from one of the focus group discussions that we had, this was acknowledged by um, by Ming by uh, other Malaysian students. You know, they're saying that okay, um, Malaysian um, uh, you know, you have different learning style. I have a different learning style because other students they prefer to ask questions during seminars. So that's interesting, and. Like I said earlier, Samek was marginalized. And Samek, when she was sharing her experience, she also shared Ming's experience because she was there in the same class. And she said, you know what? Ming contributed really good ideas, but he was marginalized, you know? So this again shows that Ming was being attentive because he's the one who takes control of how he wants to experience life, how he wants to experience learning. Okay, and finally is Kayin. So Kayin is a Malaysian student in Malaysia. Um, so Kayin is also interesting. Kayin is similar like uh, Samak in the UK. So um, uh, Kayin, she's always um, sharing. She's always um, verbally contributing. She's always, you know, contrib um, she does everything. She does, she takes notes, she, she raises her hands, she nods, she shakes her head, everything. You know, she's a, she's a good student. And um, what's interesting about her is that um, she, in one of the seminars that I observed her, she challenged the tutor. So how did she challenge the tutor? So during the seminar, um, um, they were discussing about this one question, and then you know the tutor was writing her answers on the on the whiteboard. So as um, Kayin was looking at the answer, what happens was that. Um, Kayin saw that one of the answers that she believes was wrong, the one that was written by the tutor. So she put up her hand and she said, uh, Doctor, uh, 
I think the answer is wrong. I think this is the answer, you know. And what's interesting is that the uh, the tutor was like, um, I mean, the tutor was not intimidated. You know, she was like, oh, okay, really? Um, I think it's correct and everything. And then um, when Kayin explained, you know what she did? She actually stood up and she went to the board and explained to the tutor. Very interesting. And I was I was a bit uh, surprised because I don't think that is common in Malaysian students, you know, to go to to actually go to the front and challenge the tutor in front of the whole class. I mean, it's not a bad thing. It's good. You know, it means that, OK, if if you if I think your answer is wrong, I think I have to say something about it. Right. So that's good. And I think that is how she could be interpreted as being attentive. And during my interview and focus group discussion with her, she also mentioned that um, because she's a Chinese, she said she went to um, to Chinese schools. She was not familiar with the English language. So she said, you know, after she came to the university, she saw the need to 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 um, to really master the language. Okay, so what she did was she used the um, seminar platform to practice her language, you know, and then she, she also told me about, you know, okay, um, the reason I, I think I need to be good in English is because at, in one, one day, you know, I'm going to work with an international company. And in order for me to work with an international, international company, she said that she needed to be good in English. So that's one thing. And she also, I mean, despite uh, what's interesting is that what, another reason why I interpreted her as, as being attentive is because um, this, uh, so she, she thinks that um, uh, uh, English language is important. I mean, everybody thinks that the language is important, right? Uh, and, but she shared also that some of her friends, some of her Chinese friends, considered her as banana. So banana is a term where um, you are uh, yellow on the outside and you are white on the inside. So, you know, you might be Chinese, you might be Malay, but you are actually English, you know, just because you speak English, you know. And despite being perceived like this by her friends, by her classmates, she still maintain using the English language because she knows she has her aim. So this again shows that she takes control of her current learning experience and also she makes the decision to, you know, to, okay, this, uh, I, this, is, the, uh, this is the future that I want, so I'm going to work for it, you know. So again, like I said, you know, she's being attentive, all right. So, um, so this is one of the, um, I mean, I'm not going to bore you with the extracts. I'm not going to bore you with the um, examples, but this is one of the examples where I told you Sam um, actually volunteered and explained to the whole class, you know, her answer. And again, you know, she, she um, um, so that's, even though she was marginalized in the beginning, she still shared her answer. Okay. All right. And this is also another um, example of, um, of a Malaysian student uh, in Malaysia. Sorry, it's this one. So this is when I told you uh, the one that Kayin um, actually um, told the tutor that the answer was wrong. Okay, and then again, uh, you know, as you see um, at the bottom there, the tutor said, "Okay, I will check this again, and I will share with you the answers." Right? Okay, so it's good. I think the tutor in this um, context was not intimidating. She was very welcoming. She did not say you know what, um, you know, she, she, she did not say, okay, you're wrong, I'm right, okay, but she was willing to accept or to, to um, discuss the answer, so that's really good, I think, all right, so this is one of the, um, uh, some of the interview extracts that I got, um, so most, well, I can't say most because I'm doing qualitative, but uh, the Malaysian students that I interviewed, they would say, you know, um, they ask questions when, uh, when, uh, the tutor nominated them, you know, when, uh, in fact, here, Sam um, said, you know, I've never, never, I've never asked if I don't know something, I ask and not, again, and not is considered as the go-to um, uh, person. And Kaisara, also another Malaysian student, so she, what she did was she, she said, you know, when I'm happy, when I'm prepared, then I can explain. So again, you know, she, she's aware of her ability, she's aware of her feelings, and she decides on whether or not she wants to explain to the whole class or to the small group, okay? 
So this is the one that I uh, mentioned earlier when um, I said in during the focus group discussion, Ming um, and um, Fatih and, and Amar and Puspa, they were aware of um, the fact that, okay, different people have different types of uh, uh, different uh, studying style, learning styles. So, you know, it's okay. We accept that, right? So, because if you see here, Amar says, when you don't or when you don't understand, we'll just keep quiet or you study after you finish your class. And then Ming said, you know, when I understand or not, also both ways, I keep quiet. If there's something I don't understand, I Google and I go back home and study with my book. Or I ask somebody else if really, really need to understand. But either way, I keep quiet in the seminar. And Amar acknowledged that, you know, oh, it's okay. I think that is the way somehow, that is the way how someone, different type of studying, right? So again, you know, these students are being attentive. They are aware, okay, you have different um, learning styles. I have different learning styles. So that's fine, right? Okay, so the next one, what does it mean? What does it mean for us? You know, what does it mean for the students if you're students? Um, what does it mean if, uh, you know, so um, some, of, some of you might ask, so what? Right. So what if students are being attentive? You know, um, what uh, what can you can what can we take from this? So from my perspective, as a student, if you're a student, your role is to understand that it's OK if you don't prefer to contribute in class. OK, it does not mean that you're not smart. It does not mean that you're passive. And in fact, even if people consider you as passive, it's OK. You know, passive does not have to be a negative thing. As long as you know how you learn, you know, um, uh, how, you know well, you know well your strength, your weaknesses, you know, you be responsible of what you should know, of what you want, you know, and then you make the decision to achieve your aim. And I think students should be able to be comfortable with themselves, you know, like I said, again, to know their strengths, to know our strengths, to know our weaknesses is fine, you know, because I think if we accept what's lacking if accept if we accept what we need to improve if we accept what we're good at then i think we can use this this strengths and weaknesses better to 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 maximize our potential okay and also our students also need to understand that if you contribute if you ask questions it does not only benefit you it benefits other students because i think i said this many times in class I think teachers say this many times in class, in fact, that if you ask questions, sometimes your friends can benefit from the answer, You're right? I mean, they might ask, mm, they might have, have similar um, confusion, they might have similar misunderstanding. So when you do, when, when you actually um, ask questions or when you uh, give your, your ideas, your opinions, it means that, you know, you are doing uh, you are doing a favor to the other students who who don't want to ask so you be that role okay and the next one um i think for students i think my students uh, in particular they are always worried about their language proficiency i mean i'm not perfect nobody in this world is perfect right and i think from the errors that we make we learn from them there's always there's always room for improvement. And I think we need to understand that you always can improve. I'm still learning. I'm still improving myself. And, you know, if you know this, I think then that's when your potential will um, will be maximized. You know, go for it. You know, you can do this. And for the students, know this, regardless of how you see yourself or regardless of how you think others see you or, you know, what ever for whatever reason you have to understand that your you matter your voice matter what you say is what you say matter okay and i want to also share with you um of the lecturer's role or the educator's role right? if teacher's role what are your roles in you know we might say okay well, uh, i did talk in the beginning about the three national uh, educations education documents and I talk about the need to be proficient and talk about that. But, and then I say, you know, it's okay for students not to say anything. But this is where our role comes in. You know, we come into the class to, to help the students, to facilitate the students. You know, I'm very strict with my students. If you ask my students, I don't smile in class. I, well, I smile sometimes, but not all the time. But, you know, you I also have to remind myself that I have to be warm. I have to be welcoming 
you know i have to welcome ideas i always have to encourage students to give their ideas to give their opinions to share their answers to ask questions because we don't ask enough questions and i i, I like the idea of flipping the role you know um the information does not always have to come from the lecturers, from the teachers. No, it can come from the students. With the technology that we have today, students can take the role of a teacher. Te students can take the role of the of uh, a knowledge giver. You know, because that's what I do in class anyway. And and my students prove that they can. They 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 comprehend better. They engage better with the content if we allow them to take that role. And I think I try best to be as flexible as I can. I, I don't want to determine how students should learn, you know, for example, if the students just take notes, you know, I don't want us to go and say, why are you always taking notes? Why are you not contributing in class? We don't want to for the students to be demotivated. We want students to be motivated. OK, we want the students to be engaged because I mean, even though the students are taking notes, it doesn't mean that they're not engaged. Right. It doesn't mean that they're not listening to you. They're not focusing on the content. No, it does not mean that. It's just that they're listening. They have to take time to decipher. And I think another 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 um, uh, way that we could uh, take our role, you know, as uh, um, an educator is that we we you know this is this is classic behaviorism but it works believe me it works i think it works regardless of the year you're teaching you know the age of students you're teaching because believe me students i mean we love compliments we love praises right what more the students they love that as well and <clears throat> i think um we should also allow students to to be responsible of their own learning you know like I said earlier, students need to be responsible. They need to take action. They need to know their role. You know, as a student, they have to study. And we also need to allow them to, to be responsible. You know, they have to take, okay, for, with, the, with the online learning that we're, we're um, experiencing now, is even more students' empowerment. You know, you have to empower students. They have to decide whether they want to contribute during a synchronous um, session or not. They have to decide. And I think, we should also provide, I normally provide a platform for the students to ask questions, to give opinions. So every, um, after every uh, lesson, I allow for Q&A session. And the thing is, what, with Q&A session, it's interesting because, you know, after we give lecture and then we say, okay, any questions? And then we keep quiet, so no questions. Okay, thank you, that's it for today. But that's, I think we can do more than that. I think students need time to decipher. They need time to comprehend what they have just learned. You know? So give them one to two minutes. Okay, uh, take your time, allow them to discuss with their friends. You know, okay, if they not understand this, if they understand that. And I think it's, it's interesting to also look at this um because you know we, we 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 need to know how to ask questions as well during q a you know if they don't have questions then we ask questions and the way we ask questions is also important because that that should um, the, the question that we ask should allow them to answer you know and and then i think again give them time and the prompts that we give them for them to start discussing about a topic so that is very important and we don't just okay do you understand this content okay yes you know so that's it okay so you understand okay fine that's good right and then that's it we should also okay what do you what don't you understand you know what do you think about this sometimes when students ask me miss what do you think about this i say what do you think you know we ask them back you know we reply to them with a question right and um i think we the way we respond to the question again like i said earlier you know if the student asks question then you ask them back what do you think you know and i think uh, i mean some some might be saying that okay that might be applicable to to um tertiary students you know tertiary level students and it might not be um applicable to um, the younger ones, the younger students. But the thing is, I think the prompt that we give students is very important. If the students ask questions, but I mean, I oh, because uh, I teach also um, TASA students. So during when they have their classroom observation, when they when they go for teaching practicum, you know, I told them that. OK, so for example, they're teaching about um, animals. You don't have to say, you know, you show a picture, you don't have to say this is an elephant, right? 
you can ask them what is this they know what an elephant is oh so if they say it's gajah okay so what is gajah in english you know some of them some of them will know unless you know if they really don't know and then you ask, and then you, you you tell them the the that the picture is an elephant you know but the thing is we need to i think i think we need to allow them time we need to give them time to think you know because we don't i think we were lacking in that sense and I, I always say this to my students, there is no such thing as a stupid question. You can ask as many questions as you want and then we'll discuss, you know. And this is this is what I saw from the uh, UK seminars. The tutor always encourages students to ask questions, to share their opinions. She's always like, okay, um, do we have any questions? Okay, what do you think about this? Okay, um, what do you think about that? So, you know, she allows these students to, to 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 share their experience to share their opinions okay and i think i think we can change our students we can, i mean we don't have to go global to change students i think we can change the ones that we are teaching the ones who are closer to us we can change them how i think we can change them from not contributing, they might, you know, before this, because in my class, sometimes some students, they might just be the type who's writing questions, but with the questions, that, uh, writing and uh, writing notes and everything, taking notes or only nodding, agreeing to what uh, their friends are saying. And I always say this, okay, you're nodding, right? Um, uh, why are you nodding? You know, why do you agree? And I tell them, you know, even though they agree, um, they can always say that, you know, okay, yeah, I agree with this person because of this, 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 this. You know, the, the prompts, again, again, the prompts and the questions that we ask the students is very important. And finally, I think as much as we're saying that students are being attentive, students should be attentive, you know, should take control of their own learning. I think the educators, the lecturers, teachers, anyone can also be attentive, you know, at the end of the day, we can change people you know um we can we can be the agent of change okay all right so with that i think that's it for for the session um let's see do we have um questions or do you want to share what you think um yeah so i mean i'm i'm very open for for um i'm very open for for comments, for feedback, what do you think? Do you think this is applicable in your context? Do share. Hi, everyone. Because if we don't have a question, then I think, or if you if you don't have any comments, I mean, um, I think we can end the session if you want. Hi, Zarina. Hello. Um, hello, this is Darshini here. Hi. Uh, if no one has a question at the moment, I'll just ask you um, some questions. Yep. Uh, but before that, thank you so much for presenting um, this topic. I think it's a very timely topic. Uh, given that uh, there isn't a lot of exposure or there isn't a lot of emphasis on uh, agency uh, in a Malaysian context. Mm -hmm. um, so I have several questions for you, actually. One is, um, so when discussing the concept of agency, uh, it, all, it often goes hand in hand with discussing structure as well. And um, perhaps it's, it was a time constraints, but um, I, I realized that you didn't really talk about that in that sense. So I'm wondering if that's the case and given your conception of what agency is, how would you differentiate agency between um, other terms in uh, TESOL or SLA, for example, like self-regulation or autonomy, because the 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 conception that you use um, overlaps very much with self-regulation and autonomy. Um, so can you respond to that? Yep. Okay. So is that the only um, question, Dashini? Because um, you said <clears throat> you have several. <laughs> yeah. Sorry, my voice is a bit, um, it's a bit hoarse right now. Um, 
so you also talked about the lecturers being agents of change um, in your implications. I wonder what is your opinion, uh, given our current education reforms, lecturers or academics are actually, at least in the public sector, they're expected to be at a C2 level of proficiency on the CEFR. So given this policy, many academics actually struggle to even reach this level of proficiency because it's a very native-like proficiency. So how do you see academics actually exercising agency in light of this particular structural barrier? And I'm sure there will be other structural barriers as well, but uh, that's my second question. And then my third question was, um, I think you described the UK lecturers as being someone who allowed opportunities for students to be more actively engaged in class. Um, and yet I found that it was really interesting that you said you, the student or the, that participant that you interviewed wasn't really so willing to share. Um, and yet the, the reverse was true in a Malaysian context. And you would think it would be the other way around um, when you, you're given opportunities to share you would have students sharing, but then you said that despite that, um, this student didn't share. But then in your implications, you also asked us to have to to allow more opportunities for students to share. You know, as lecturers or as academics, we need to allow that kind of opportunities for students to share. So I'm just wondering, how do you reconcile this tension then? Okay, those are my three questions. Thank you All so right. much. Thank you so much, Doshini. Wow, very challenging questions. <laughs> So anyway, um, so to to just um, answer your your first question, the concept of agency, and then you know you talk about um, self regulation, you talk about autonomy. So I think, like you said, it does overlap. You know, um, this these three concepts do overlap, and I, I'm pretty sure, in fact, um, uh, these three concepts also may overlap with other concepts as well in education or non education. But with the agency. What, I, I won't say um, what's different, but uh, the focus of agency um, is that um, it it is it is um, the 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 persons, the individuals' role to actually um, take into consideration, you know, the kind of um, experience they want to 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 have. And I think um, with this concept, which may also be you know uh, similar to excuse me, similar to um, autonomy, you know, people uh, with autonomy, people also um, consider, you know, their experience, you know, consider other people's perceptions before they do something, before they take um, into consideration um, or before they decide on something. So again, like I said, you know, they are similar. And then I think the reason I use um, agency is because um, because I think agency um, fits better with the data that I have. And I think um, uh, with the readings that I've done, uh, limited obviously, um, is that um, I see students, you know, they, they know what they want. They know um, the kind of um, learning that they want. So, you know, with that, okay, um, I, I, I'm, I'm gonna decide that this is the experience that I want to, to have. And to answer your second one is the lecturers being attentive and, you know, with the C2 level, having having to reach C2 level. I mean, to be honest, I'm just one. And again, um, I, in that sense, we have to um, take control of our own um, uh, proficiency. You know, if you think, if I think because I know that I'm a C1 and I know that you know I know that I can be better I know I can be better with 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 practice and that's why in my opinion I would you know I would um, force myself to use the language I would force myself I would try to improve myself and I think that's the that's the that's the, that's what I want that's what I want to 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 change and I want to change that for myself so that's again an addition an additional um, element of agency so you you decide something because you want to change you want to affect other people you want to affect you you want to affect your behavior so yeah so that's one and and you know um, again with the students and lecturers so if we want to better ourselves if we know where we are even if we don't know where we are our level um you know we can always say 
okay, I can always improve myself. I mean, to be honest, I consciously use the language um, when I'm at work with the English department lecturers because I know if I don't, then my my proficiency might um, you know deteriorate, right? So I, I th that is the conscious um, decision that I make, you know. And for the third question, so it's interesting. Uh, I I did think about this as well. Despite the UK tutors encouraging students to share their their opinion, to share their their um, answers, to contribute. I mean, the Malaysian students decide not to, right? And I think um, uh, what I did not probably uh, tell you and which I should have is that when the tutors did that, other students did contribute. But the thing is, what's interesting, she did not force the Malaysian students to speak, even though they didn't speak, you know? She did not force them, okay, you, you know, speak. Okay, you, what's your answer? What's your answer? No, she always asked for volunteers. And when she gives them time, I saw that other students, you know, the international students, the local students, they come in and then they share their answers, they share their opinions. And um, and again, like I said, you know, even though um, the, even though the verbal contribution by the Malaysian students are limited, some of them did share. You know, and as one of the examples that I that I showed you is the one who who uh, Samek who you know volunteered. Yeah, like like you know, if you watch her, she was like enthusiastically volunteering, and then you know, okay, okay, why don't you share? And then she went to the front of the class to to share her answers. So again, I think. Um, it is the tutor's role to encourage, but at the same time, you know, the students, it's okay, we, we should allow flexibility, flexibility, you know, we should allow to say, okay, if you don't want to share it, fine, it's your prerogative, you have, you decide, but, you know, um, what do you think about this? Always ask questions, I think, and that's what I do in my class, like I said, you know, I always ask students, what do they think? And, I mean, to be honest, it's always, sometimes it's always the same student, dominating but it's fine you know and sometimes i just ask okay what what the rest of you think about this um, opinion so you you ask them questions you take time to i think elicit more opinions to get more information from the students and to always allow students to ask questions i hope that answer um, your questions dashini okay thank you so much for the question uh thanks serena i i just have a follow-up um okay. I think uh, so. <clears throat> I see where you're coming from, and uh, I understand the the experiences that you've had. Um, you know, it shapes the way you view agency in this way, and I think that's that's really interesting, and um, it, it's helpful to actually hear this this coming from you. But I also wonder if perhaps it might also be like more instructive if you could maybe in the beginning of your. Or, I, I don't know if you're going to be sharing this um, this particular piece of research elsewhere, but just something that I feel uh, ought to be discussed as well is also structural barriers, because when you talk about agency, it always goes along with structure. And um, especially if you kind if you if you conceptualize agency from a sociological perspective, that really you can't really discuss agency without discussing structure and i think that's really really important and it will enrich your discussion even more um given that you have a very interesting data um but yes just to kind of you know boost your your level of analysis even more thank you thank you so much i'll take that into consideration thank you thank you Zunina. thank you all right so um yeah, thank you, Warit. Yeah, so Warit says here that she's just sharing the idea of pointing or argue with teachers to some people are considered as rude. Some educators prefer students to absorb the knowledge without questioning it. It's, good, it's a good way that we are moving towards two-way communication in a positive way. Yeah, I think that's true. And I think that's why I emphasize on the flexibility. I think um, we need to, to um, be flexible. We need to to allow students to be on their own at one point, you know, to, to be responsible of their own learning. Because, you know, at the end of the day, if we push them, you know, and my focus on, on for, for the data is, is not so much on education, but the implication is, you know, but uh, because I look at identity from the linguistics perspective. And um, I think uh, um, despite, 
looking at it from this, you know, the, the, the implication that I, I suggest or, or I want to share with you today is that I think, you know, as a teacher, I'm always a teacher, you know, I want my data to be, to be um, useful, to benefit um, me personally, because to be honest, um, I did change a couple of ways on how I teach my students on how I um, uh, go about my my lectures, well, not lectures, but, but my, my lessons. So, you know, allowing students to be responsible. Okay, any more sharing, any more things that, you know, you want to share with me, any feedback, let me know, you know, you can share now <laughs> if you want, but I'm not going to force you <laughs> again. I mean, because to be honest, like I said earlier, if um, I mean, I know everyone's busy and everything. Thank you so much for, um, for, 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 for being here. Thank you. I really appreciate it. I really appreciate the comments. I really appreciate all the, the, um, <laughs> excuse me, all the feedback, you know, if you want to get in touch with me personally, you can do so as well. You know, some of you are on my Facebook probably and others might be on mobile. So yeah, let me know. Um, okay. All right. Thank you so much, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, have thank a you good very day. much, Serena. Thank you. Have a good day and have fun. Take care. Stay safe. Thank you. Ustaz Hayi, boleh dah kot kita. Oh, thank you. Thank you so much.